Well, hey guys, greetings. Um, I've been getting quite a few questions about redfish flies. I know some of you dudes are planning trips down to uh, the Louisiana marsh this fall and winter, um, and you want to be prepared for it, and that's a cool thing. Um, before we, t when we talk about redfish flies, we kind of have to break it up in into two different subsets. Um, when we fish for redfish in the spring and summertime, those fish were generally fishing in shallow marsh ponds that have a lot of grass. Uh, these are going to be fish from pretty small up to about 10 pounds, maybe a few over, but mostly under. Um, since these are shallow ponds and the ponds are very grassy, uh, it's easy to get hung up in. Uh, we're typically throwing smaller, lighter flies, stuff that's kind of shrimpy. Um, I'll look for stuff that rides hook point up. At times we guards. Um, you know, a, a, I guess a quick example would be uh, this. We, we call it a, a shrimp head fly because in the water it kind of darts and moves, and the shape of it's about like just the head of a you know, big marsh shrimp. Um, small crab flies, th things like that, even small quants. Um, now in the winter and the fall, which I think is what you're interested in now, it's kind of a different game. First off, the, the bulls that we seek in the winter, um, it's an entirely different fish from those summertime pond redfish. Well, summertime pond redfish, you know, you're looking for grassy ponds, and grass is what they're related to. Your winter bulls, you're going to find them, first off, where it's not grassy. Uh, you're going to find them where you have oysters. That's the main thing you're looking for is oysters. And if you can find a, a nice bank on a larger bay that has oysters and some drains coming out, prime, prime type of spot to look for. Um, and they're also going to be in deeper water. You know, your bulls are bigger fish. Uh, when you're dealing with a 30-pound fish, you're talking about a fish who, from stomach to, to top of his back, maybe this deep. And since the fish is that deep, he's going to require deeper water. So generally, we're fishing for those bulls in more water in, say, two, two and a half, maybe even three feet of water. Uh, so we're going to want a fly that's heavier and gets down quicker. Um, also, bigger fish, they're in there primarily looking for mullet, uh, or bigger crabs, they're looking for big bait. Uh, and so we want something that's a little bit bigger and pre presents uh, more of a, a profile for them. And so there's a fly that I started tying that is, is kind of um, a love child between Dan Blanton's Whistler and a Tarpon Toad. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is, like Dan Blanton's Whistler, you have a, a material tail, you have palmered hackle, and you got weight up front. Like a tarpon toad, though, the tail is posted up. And this is important because it keeps that tail from falling around the hook. Um, I know Dan, for his whistlers, uses a lot of bucktail and stuff. I like using uh, finer fibers that move more. Uh, so I use uh, a lot of either, this is finished raccoon, which I, I think is my, my favorite tying material now. Uh, but I also tie these with marabou. For you guys, I would honestly suggest using marabou. Finished raccoon is really pretty expensive. And by the time you start buying patches and all the different colors, uh, you can blow up a lot of cash. Uh, the marabou will work just as fine for you if you're just coming down for a trip or two. Uh, I like the finished raccoon because I find it more durable than marabou. might move a little bit better. It also maintains a little bit more bulk. But before I started tying them with the raccoon, I was tying them with marabou and caught plenty, plenty of fish on them. Uh, really what made me start tying this fly is I was tying uh, tarpon toad style flies for redfish. Uh, and I got lazy because the tarpon toad, you tie in the tail. And then you tie a merkin style head, you know, where you're tying the yarn or the EP fibers and, you know, lay it out flat and trim it to look like a crab head. It's a lot of work. So I got lazy and I just started palmering a hackle up there and um, I find it works just as well. It's quicker, it's easier, um, and, and it makes a good fly. Uh, color combinations. Okay, I love this. The LSU combination. Louisiana redfish, I love an LSU fly. Purple and yellow or chartreuse this is kind of i think halfway between yellow and chartreuse they call it fluorescent chartreuse uh whatever variations but this is a, a great color pattern also purple tail with a black collar works very very well um, another pattern that i like a lot and this is tied with marabou is black tail with red collar uh, that works very well chartreuse tail with a black collar works really good um, then i'll also do I'll do something a little bit more of a natural subdued pattern. Uh, sometimes that's what the fish want, although usually it's not really necessary, with either brown or tan for the back. This finished raccoon is brown and tan and has a little flex of black in it. Uh, and this is a Cree hackle, but of course you could use a tan hackle or whatever other color suited you. And I'll give you a little bit of a close-up of each of these. That's the, the brown and Cree. That's the purple and chartreuse. Black and red in marabou. There's black and red in finished raccoon for you. And then 
chartreuse in black. Okay, for hooks, um, you know, again, for those summertime redfish, um, I'll use the Yamagatsu SC15s are a good hook, they're very bitey. Uh, but what happened was I was using those for my wintertime fishing, and I started getting a lot of those hooks opening up on big fish, and I was dropping fish because of them. So I started using their big brother, the uh, Yamagatsu SL12S. Yamagatsu SL12S. Um, it's a beefier fly than the um, SC15, still very bitey. Um, I find that I don't have to put a whole lot of effort into hook sets and the, and the fish latched their way on. Um, trout sets will still lose fish though. You can ask my brother about that. We had an interesting trip full of trout sets last year. So I get the hook and the vise. Uh, very simple. Uh, I'm going to do this in black and red. Um, get some fluorescent red thread. I'm going to lay down a little base of thread. And I'm going to start my tail farther back than the hook point because I want there to be a fair amount of collar. I find that collar helps push water and adds a little bulk. So I don't want to start that far back there, that, that far up. I mean, Then for my marabou, I want to look for a, a, a quill that's very limber. I don't want something that's overly stiff because this is going to move. It's going to be the tail. So I get one that, uh, yeah, this one's real real nice and, and limber. Feels good. Um, first off, I look at the tip. If the tip is real separated, I'll leave it alone. If the tip looks kind of feathery and joined, I'll pluck out the tip. So then I take the fibers and I pull the fibers back. And I can feel where the stem goes from being fairly stiff to pretty limber. And I'm going to cut it just into the stiff portion a little bit so that uh, I'm not wasting any of the limber portion by having thread wraps over that limber portion. I want that limber portion to work for me and create a little bit longer tail. So cut that, just lay it on top the hook, hit it with some wraps, and uh, something I do just to help make it more secure, especially the marabou. I hit those butts there with some cement. Uh, this is just Sally's. Uh, sometimes I use super glue, but basically I'll grab whatever's handy. Um, okay, so here's the trick, and this is key for this fly. Uh, you know, when you got a fairly long limber tail like this, that tail's going to want to end up around that hook. So I'm going to post the tail up, and you know, before that, I do need to add some flash. Uh, one or two strands of flash is really all you need. This is just flash of nothing fancy. I just want something that can maybe catch a glint of light and, and help additionally attract your attention. Honestly, a lot of times uh, I'm lazy about it. But I don't or I forget to put the flash in and I still catch plenty of fish on them without flash. Uh, I think it's more about the bulk of the fly and the profile that it presents and the fact that it gets down uh, to where I needed to be. So I just throw a couple of strands of flash in inside. Get it all nice and straight. Throw a few wraps around it. And then here's the important part. To keep this tail from wrapping around the hook, I'm going to post it up. It's just like posting up a parachute wing on a trout fly. I wrap the thread around the base of the feather. And uh, I like to actually give it Quite a few wraps. I like I like to really make a kind of a stiff base there for it. Okay, so I, I get that posted up, and then I come in and I'll make a couple of wraps behind it too, just to give it a little additional um, hold up there. Okay, I'm gonna trim my flash. I don't want it too long behind the tail. There we go. So there's my tail tied in, nice and simple. Um, next, I'm gonna tie in my dumbbell eyes. Um, I use dumbbell eyes. I actually prefer hourglass eyes. I find they go on a little neater. They, they tie in better, but uh, whatever you have is good. Um, my go-to weight for my eyes is 1 30th of an ounce. Sounds like kind of heavy, but uh, we need it to get down. 1 30th is my go-to. I'll tie some with 1 40th ounce eyes. Uh, that's what this is. Um, the um, 1 40th ounce I use if the water is really clear and conditions are slick. Because in those conditions, you usually see the fish from farther away. If you're seeing the fish from farther away, uh, you've got more time to set up on them. You can usually lead them more, and so that fly has more time to get down to their level. Uh, but, you know, a lot of times we have water that's a little bit stained or murky, uh, or there might be the wind blowing, putting a rip on the water. And, and when that happens, a lot of times those fish just magically appear right in front of the boat, or as my friend Justin says, right fucking there. And uh, when, they, when they appear that quick, 
you got to drop the fly pretty much right in front of them, and that fly's got to get down quickly uh, before the fish gets past. And, and so I like a lot of weight for that. So 130th is my go-to. I will tie some and have some 140th ounce in my box. I will also have some 120th eyes in my box. If the water's particularly funky, or sometimes the fish will be sulking where they're really hugging the bottom, or I may run into a bunch of big black drum. Uh, black drum pretty much will only eat off the bottom, uh, and that's where the 120th ounce comes in. The 120th ounce is also really happy, really, really handy. Um, if you're pissed off at the guy that's push pulling you, hit him in the back of the head with one of those ones on a back cast, and he'll straighten right up. Okay, so I got the eyes tied in. I hit him with uh, some cement, whatever you're using. Okay. Then I just take a nice uh, saltwater neck hackle. Um, you know, I like using the, the whiting American hackle. They, they produce mighty fine stuff, and, and uh, I find it turns out to be a better value, even though it costs a little bit more than some of the other junk out there. Um, I usually use two. just kind of depends on how full they are and how big they are. I'll strip them to where I'm just barely getting into the fluff. I really don't want too much of the fluff. Uh, there's going to be plenty of movement from all that either marabou or finish raccoon on the back of it. Tie in the butts, come forward. Just a little half hitch, keep the thread out the way. Um, then again, I'll hit where the butts are tied in. A little cement. Actually, I'll run cement all the way up the shank of the hook. Um, you know, a lot of times when the redfish, and redfish have little peg teeth, um, nothing significant, but they're there. And sometimes those little teeth will split the stem of your hackle, and if that happens, it wants to unravel. Or if you lay a little cement or super glue down, uh, it'll keep the whole thing from unraveling and make the fly last a little bit longer. Uh, yes, I'm not using hackle pliers. Um, I got in the habit of just doing stuff quick and dirty when I was guiding and had to tie flies for people, not just me, and had to tie flies that were likely to get lost or broken off. So. This is what I do. I don't do weed guards on wintertime flies because, like I said, we're not fishing grass. We're fishing oysters. Um, weed guards not going to help you a lot because when you're fishing oysters, this is going to get wedged. Those eyes will get wedged uh, between oyster shells just as quickly as a hook will hook oyster shell. So get a few wraps around there and trim that off. Throw a simple half hitch. Then something I like to do when I'm going to a whip finish so I take some of my cement, and again, I'll do it with nail polish, I'll do it with super glue, I'll do it with whatever. And I just lay a little bit on the thread like that, and then whip finish it in, and I've got a, a well-secured finish on my fly. And, I mean, that is it. That's, a, that's about as simple as you can get. And these are very effective. They, they look great in the water, they move great. Uh, the marabou, when it's wet, will compress down a bit. It'll look kind of like that. It'll look kind of snaky or plastic wormy. The finished raccoon, if you, leave, if you leave a good bit of the underfur in there, it actually will keep this bulky profile in the water, which is really cool. And then the, the, the guard hairs uh, move and flit around just as much as the marabou's. It's really cool stuff. But again, um, it's really not necessary. You can uh, uh, you know, use marabou, and, and it's plenty sufficient. works great. And you probably got some in your box already. Um, if you don't have marabou, I have to tell you, I'm very happy with the marabou I get from Stone River Outfitters. I order online, they send pretty big packs, and, and I find it's usually nice and webby, and there's a lot of really you know, soft fibers that move a lot. So this is going to move great in the water, and it'll catch fish. It doesn't take anything fancy. I do another variation on it. Um, in 2001, I came up with a pattern, and it was, it was called, I called it the Red Chaser Whistler. It was just a variation on Dan Blanton's Whistler. And it's flashy. Uh, it is prismatic mylar tied in. I, I, I kept tr Blanton's tradition of doing the chenille in front of the tail material. And then I wrapped the hackle. And this one I actually posted up. When I normally do these, I normally actually started out doing these smaller for the marsh pond fish. And, and I didn't post the gold material up. And, and uh, I used a jig style hook to light it and hook up and all that. But for the bulls, I go ahead and post it up. And um, what, what I find is a lot of times, the redfish will be tight-lipped. Um, they're not spooking off the fly. They're just ignoring it. And um, sometimes what I'll find is that if I tie on something really flashy and throw it in front of them, it'll get a reaction strike. And I've had that saved a day on numerous occasions, including with big bulls, um, 
one, it'll do one of two things normally. It'll, it'll get the reaction strike, or it'll scare the hell out of them and they'll run away. Um, the other thing is that you want to bring some top water. Um, day in and day out, you know, top water is not the, the highest percentage way to catch redfish uh, because they're not always willing to come up. They're not, 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 they're not really made to eat off the top. If you look at, red, at a redfish, their mouth is on the bottom of their head. Uh, and it's oriented that way for a reason. However, when they're being active and they're willing to eat top water, the other thing too is a lot of times they miss a lot of strikes of top water because they miss it. Um, but when they're willing to eat top water, there's nothing more exciting than redfish eating on top because because that mouth is low slung, they've got to come out of the water and down onto the fly to eat. Um, so you, you can throw poppers. I love making these hot lips gurglers. It's a gurgler with a bottom lip and a top lip. And they're very easy to tie. It takes about five minutes. Materials are cheap. Um, the foam I use for them is not the typical two millimeter foam that's too thin, doesn't give you stiff enough um, surface. So I use about a one eighth inch foam. And uh, a lot of times I can't find the sheets of one eighth inch foam, but at Hobby Lobby, they'll have little novelties like foam visors or a little foam baseball style pennant uh, that are this one eighth inch thickness for 97 cents each. I'll grab them and I use them. And just tie in a, a, a tail, you make your hot lips gurgler. Uh, they work good, they're easy to tie and they make a fantastic popping, gurgling noise uh, whenever you work them. So anyway, that's a few patterns for you. Of course, you know, crab patterns will work. Traditional quans will work. Um, crabs that are, you know, like quarter size or even a little bit bigger will work. Just make sure you got a good bit of weight on them. Um, you can also do the same fly um, as I tied here, but instead of palm ring hackle, if you've got an EP brush or any kind of dubbing brush, um, you can palmer that around and, and that'll work just fine. You can make flies with an EP tail and palmer a head on it or make a, um, a, a dubbing brush palmered head uh, and that'll work. It's, it's all just kind of variations on, this, on the same theme, making something that looks kind of bulky that's going to get down quick enough uh, and, and maybe push a little bit of water. And again, the color combinations, uh, the purple and chartreuse is my go-to as well as purple with a black collar. Black with a red collar, um, I'll have some natural colors browns, tans, chartreuse with a black collar, and then also too, it wouldn't be a bad idea too if you wanted to do something like in white or white and tan, uh, and that's it. Hopefully that's helpful for you. I know I'm going to see you guys, uh, some of you guys down here in the marsh this fall. Looking forward to it. Good fishing.